Welcome to part 4 of the Vertical Vivarium Conversion mini-series. If you haven't watched the other episodes in this series, I suggest you watch them prior to this one. Anyways, in this episode I will show you how I set up and plant my vivariums. Throughout this presentation I will explain how I choose my plants, and how you can make decisions on what plants you should choose for your vivarium. This is not an all-inclusive guide on what plants to choose for any specific animal, nor will I explain in great detail how to care for your plants, in this video at least. I will simply give you a good platform to start with. Before we set up our vivarium though, let's prep our door. Remember those screws from episode 1? Well, let's simply put a dab of silicone on them so that they don't rust. I'm sure that there are other ways that you could do this, but this is what I'll do. Make sure to get all of the screws both on the bottom piece and on the door. Let the silicone cure for a few hours, and then you're good to set up your vivarium. To begin, I like to add a thin layer of substrate. Afterwards, I will add a culture of springtails. In a nutshell, springtails are a tiny white hexapod that decompose organic matter. They are crucial for the success of your vivarium because they eat mold, help naturally fertilize the substrate, and much more. They can even be used as an alternative food source for smaller animals such as dart frogs. There are various ways that you can add springtails to your vivarium, but for this application I will simply dump an entire culture in. Next we are going to add the substrate. A suitable substrate for a vivarium is one that drains well and holds some residual moisture. A substrate that remains wet and becomes soggy, or a substrate that dries out quickly, won't be effective for this application. Springtails and other microfauna will also thrive in the proper substrate. To learn how to make the mix that I am using, follow the link on the screen or see the description. There are various mixes that you could use, but this blend has been very effective for me. When placing my substrate, I like to slope it upward near the back. I find that this helps encourage plant growth up the background, and in some applications, it also provides a good amount of substrate for larger background plants. This is only the initial substrate, and generally, I add a little to begin with. Then I put more in as plants are added. Since I'm adding plants to this particular background, that's where we'll begin. You can use the same substrate mix from before, but in some cases, I like to use a different blend for my background plants. Here I have a 50-50 mix of orchid bark and sphagnum moss. Also, I like to fill the planters with the substrate prior to adding the plants. Here I have some bromeliads, specifically Neoregalia fireball. I thought that these would be a good addition to this vivarium because of the red coloration and since it's a smaller species. You can add various plants to your background, but I chose bromeliads specifically for the animals that I'll be putting in this vivarium. I find that it's best to only partially bury the bromeliads roots, if at all. Next I'm going to add some Peperomia frisaria. In time, this plant will take over and cover the background of the setup, which is one of the reasons that I chose it. The bright green leaves will also contrast nicely with the fireballs once they redden. This peperomia is also tough enough to handle some trampling from small animals. As you can see, it came clustered together as a single plant, so I broke it apart. In some cases, you might need to pin your plants up to encourage them to grow in the background. This is typically only necessary until the plant's roots cling to the background. I just use some paperclip sections bent into a C, almost like a staple. Then I lightly press it into the foam over the stem of the plant. Make sure not to crush the stem of the plant though. Our background is getting there, so now let's put some plants on the ground. Here I have a Cryptanthus nubicola, which is a smaller species of earth star. I like to incorporate Cryptanthus in my projects because they provide great ground coverage, climbing spaces, and even hiding places both for animals and microfauna. Plus they look pretty cool. 
They also do very well in a vivarium and are overall pretty easy to care for. After this you will see me move things around quite a bit. I like to move the plants around until I am pleased with the design both aesthetically and functionally. By this I mean that it looks good and will provide the proper environment for the animals that I wish to house. Now I'm placing some Ficus pumula quificiola, otherwise known as oak leaf creeping fig. This plant is one of my personal favorites. The small leaves look really cool and are extremely hardy. This plant will create excellent ground coverage and eventually will work its way up the background. I find that it grows pretty slow to start, but once it becomes established, it creeps all over the place. I'll place cuttings of this in the vivarium at strategic locations throughout the remainder of this build. Next I'm placing java moss. This is an aquatic moss that grows extremely well in humid conditions such as terrariums and vivariums. My goal is to get this log mostly covered in moss, so I am carefully placing clumps of java moss on its surface. You can also tie clumps of it on using some thread, but I usually just let it attach itself naturally. This moss must be sprayed periodically during construction so that it doesn't dry out. You will also see me place pieces of this on parts of the background and in the substrate throughout this build. Now here's some Slaginella krausiana gold tips. I'm putting it in this planter so that it covers the top section of the background and so that it drapes over the sides of the log, creating a curtain of sorts. From past experiences, a lot of Slaginella can't handle animals walking on them, but this particular one seems to be more on the hardy side, which is one of the reasons why I chose it. Next I'm adding some Helxine Solaroli, commonly referred to as baby tears. I'm not sure if this plant will last or not since it's pretty delicate. I figured that I will take my chances with it because the tiny leaves could add some really nice texture to the vivarium if it thrives. That being said, variation in leaf size, shape, and color amongst your plants will create a unique and natural looking enclosure. Now let's add some more ground coverage. Here's some pillow moss that is already acclimated to a humid environment. As you can see it's about 2 inches tall and this is mostly new growth. I'm simply placing a few pieces of this near the back of the setup. Remember that little cavern in the background from the second episode? Well, I would like to get it completely lined with java moss, so I'm placing a few clumps in it. I use a lot of temper mosses in my terrariums and vivariums with great success. Mosses such as fern moss or hypno moss to name a few. That being said, I always quarantine and acclimate my mosses prior to putting them in my vivariums. This mitigates the risk of exposing my setups to any unwanted pathogens or anything similar. If you choose to use plants sourced from outside, do so at your own discretion. Here I'm adding a piece of bark with moss growing on it. It not only looks cool but will provide a good hiding spot for microfauna. Ever notice that when you pick up a log or piece of bark in the woods, it's lined with wood louse? Well that's the same idea here. Next I experimented with a few twigs, but I didn't like how they looked at this time. Here's some Peperomia Camphylotropa. I really like this plant because it adds a nice touch to the foreground. It is a pretty delicate plant, so I am concerned that it could get trampled, but we'll see how it goes. Regardless, it mainly serves as an accent plant, so if it doesn't succeed, it won't ruin the functionality of this setup. Finally, I added some sticks and decided that I liked the design, at this moment at least. That being said, we will return to the plants shortly. In the meantime let's attach the door. You could do this before planting your vivarium, but I wanted to do it last to keep the acrylic as pristine as possible. Start by screwing the hinges into the holes of the door. Now snip off the screws and put a dab of silicone on each screw. The silicone only needs a few hours to cure before the enclosure can be shut. Full 24 hour cure is not necessary. To retain the humidity in the meantime though, I simply taped a piece of plastic wrap to the front of the vivarium. Now let's jump forward a week. After the first day and looking at the setup for about a week, I really wasn't feeling the layout. I just felt that it was lacking in many ways. I thought to myself, dude you could have put a lot more moss in there and why didn't you incorporate any liverwort? So from here on out I mostly add moss, some liverwort and rearrange a lot of the setup. I also add a few more plants.
Here's a Begonia Rex. I like this particular Begonia because of the contrast between the top and underside of the leaves. It will also grow relatively tall, which I think will look nice in this setup. Also, here's an Anubius Nana. This plant does extremely well in vivariums and terrariums, even though it is typically sold as an aquatic plant. I moved all of the plants around so that the ground is sectioned off. By this I mean there is a somewhat barren foreground, a partially planted midground, and space between the midground and the background. I did this so that my animals could crawl around the front of the plants and hide behind them if they feel threatened. I wanted to maximize the ground area while also providing enough hiding places for my animals. This was one of the reasons that I rearranged the plants a little bit ago. It can be easy and tempting to overplant your vivarium, but if you are going to house a terrestrial animal, leave free space on the ground accordingly. Also keep in mind that your plants are going to grow a lot, so there's no point in stocking large quantities of plants to begin with. If you're familiar with vivariums, then you might be asking yourself why didn't he add leaf litter to this setup? Well, leaf litter is mostly added to vivariums to provide hiding places and food for microfauna such as isopods and springtails. They will break down these dead leaves and then put nutrients back into the soil. Leaf litter can even provide hiding places for some animals. Typically these leaves are placed on top of a substrate to create a thin layer. Leaf litter can also be mixed into the substrate, so the functionality of leaf litter is pretty obvious. Right or wrong, I have a somewhat different philosophy with my vivariums. I'm not a fan of how leaf litter looks and have found some ways around incorporating it into my vivariums. As you can see I added a lot of moss and other plants to this enclosure that will quickly cover the substrate. I do this because I like how it looks and also provides a similar function to leaf litter. In a few months there will pretty much be no substrate exposed. As a result, with creeping fig, moss, and other plants covering the ground, there will be an abundance of places for microfauna to hide. Also, remember that bark and those other pieces of wood? Well, those will provide additional hiding places and food for springtails and the isopods that I'm about to add to this vivarium. What about feeding the microfauna though? Don't they need a food source? Well, decomposing wood and bark in the substrate will provide some nutrients, but not as much as leaf litter. So to substitute for these nutrients I do a few things. When I prune plants I will break up pieces that aren't able to be propagated and place them somewhere on the ground, almost like a compost pile. It usually takes a few weeks or so before these plant trimmings are consumed. I trim my established vivariums monthly, so this is a somewhat regular food source. Unfortunately, since this is a new construction, not much trimming will occur for quite a while. Microfauna also eat animal excrement. This not only provides them with food, but it also cleans and fertilizes the enclosure. This can't really function as the main food source, and I don't stock my vivariums immediately, so in the meantime, this doesn't do us any good. Finally, I place fish food on my vivarium surface. I only do this about once a week, but it provides a good nutrient-rich food source for my microfauna that is cheap and readily available. Just find good locations to hide these, and don't always put them in the same spot. If the microfauna are always flocking to the same location for food, your animals will likely pick up on it, and in the process, have a feast. Obviously your microfauna will get eaten, but the goal is to have a stable enough population that your animals can't deplete. This is simply what I choose to do, and by no means do you have to follow it. My microfauna thrive in these enclosures even though I don't incorporate leaf litter. If you're looking for a method that takes less work on your part, simply get leaf litter and be done with it. To conclude I will say this, make your choices based on the types of animals you are going to house. Here are some basic questions that will get you on the right path. Are the animals terrestrial or arboreal? Will my animals trample and ruin small delicate plants? What type of lighting do my animals need? Are the plants suitable for a humid tropical environment? How adept am I at taking care of plants? These questions will help you initially make the correct choices. However, you will learn what plants work best for you by experimenting and trying different things. I should also mention that some plants will die off and then show up again when you least expect it. I've had this happen quite a bit. 
Some plants can also look unsightly when they are adapting to their new environment before they begin to thrive. For example, look at these bromeliads. There's a lot of new growth and overall they look like they're doing fairly well, but some of the leaves are dying off. This largely happened because they were pretty dried out when I received them, but I'm confident that they will bounce back. As I explained earlier, I'm not going to discuss how I care for my plants in this video, but I will say that I water my vivariums once daily. When spraying my vivarium, I always make sure to spray the moss more than anything else. This seems to really make it thrive. Finally, I highly recommend that you don't stalk your vivarium for at least a month or two. This will allow your microfauna to become well established and likewise your plants. The better established your plants are, the better they can handle animals walking all over them.